All right, so we're going to go to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 16. Philippians chapter 2, verse 16. The Apostle Paul, he writes here about running the Christian race without giving up to keep on going for the Lord. Why? Because we're holding the word of life. We have life within us that other people don't have. And because we have something that other people don't have, we need to lift it up on high and not throw in the towel, not give up the Christian race. And what I want to concentrate today is that in this sermon, we're going to look at every, nearly, nearly every verse that mentions about the Christian race or the Christian marathon. And there's a lot that we can learn over here about the Christian marathon. The Bible says, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Imagine that you are a marathon runner who ran so many miles, who worked so hard, but then you realize that the race that you're running turned out to be a waste of time. It turned out that you stopped halfway. It turned out that you weren't able to complete your race for the Lord. Then you wasted your whole life living for the Lord. And that's the reason why I want to preach this sermon, so that you don't waste your race. Everyone is running a race. Whether you're saved or whether you're lost, you have to understand you're living a race and a marathon called life. And within life, I wonder how much time you've wasted and how much you've accomplished. Could you satisfactorily... Uh, can you honestly say with satisfaction you lived a full life? Especially if you're a Christian serving the Lord, you want to make sure that uh, there's purpose when you die. If the rapture were to sound right now, would you honestly say, I've completed my course, like Paul said. I fought a good fight. I have finished my fo uh, course. So I want to help you today uh, with your life to make a full purpose, full use of it, and that you won't waste it. The time of my message today is run for your lives. Let's pray. Father God, uh, my life is in your hand, as I've always said, and uh, today's preaching it needs to be from you, not from me. Father, you know my desperation, you know my heart, and I plead the precious blood of your Son and the filling power of your Spirit and anything good that you've got in the storehouse of heaven. I selfishly request that you'll pour it on upon this uh, unworthy, poor, broken, weak vessel, not because I deserve it, but because uh, you deserve the glory and that this sermon, this message can change people's lives too so that they can better live for you. But I can't reach them. You have to reach them, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, my first point is find the route. So did you find your route? Did you find your path? To tread. Romans chapter 9, verse 16 says, so, so then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 26 says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. The Apostle Paul mentions that when the Christian runs, his or her race, that it's not done with uncertainty. It's not done of your own will. It's not done of your own way in life. Now, I'm not being Calvinist, and I'm not saying that no one has a free will. Everybody has a free will. But if you realize that this life should belong to God, not to you, that your will and your choices in life should belong to God, not to you, then what happens is when your free will align with his will, then you can live more fully for him and make sure that your race is completely run. Now, uh, let me give an example. If we see a lot of comparisons with a good marathon rather, runner and these verses, if you're going to complete your marathon really well, he's going to be confident. He's going to be prepared for what comes ahead. There are good runners that actually will look ahead, they're going to look at the terrain, look at the road, they're going to make sure that their shoes are in good condition, that they're hydrated long enough, they have a battle plan ready. And when a good marathon runner does that, he's able to complete his race and do it successfully. And that's the same thing as a good Christian runner, is that if he's going to do his race, run his race well for the Lord, he's going to prepare well. 
The problem with people in life today, and this is the problem with you people, you just live life as it is. That's your problem. Your problem is, is that whatever comes, you live up to it. Whatever worldly thing or fleshly sinful thing comes out, you take it. And then you go things by your plans, your own ways. But you have to understand that in order for you to live life successfully and run it well is to plan it out to prepare. You need to find the problems. You need to find the problems in your path that you're running in. The good marathon runner, he's going to be prepared for the problems. There's going to be a long uphill trail over there. There's going to be a stony path over here. It's going to be harder for my feet. There's going to be a narrow lane over there, and then people might be crowding against each other, and then I'll have to run ahead of some of these people or find a gap. You know, a good marathon runner, he's going to prepare for the problems. But the problem with you Christians is that you don't find those problems. You don't prepare for those problems. And if you don't, then you're going to be unconfident what comes ahead. Look at the situation with the current pandemic. There were so many churches who didn't expect it, so many churches and believers who weren't prepared, and they've been backslidden, they've been cold, they haven't intended church now for years. They haven't spiritually grown. And then pastors who have not armed themselves, and that's why they compromised with the world, the system, and bowed the knee to Baal. And you have to understand that when you prepare for the problems that come ahead, then you'll be better equipped and that uh, you will have less fear, less worry. Yes. If you're not confident, can you confidently say that you're running the race for the Lord and you know what problems are going to come up ahead? You probably don't. You don't take time to think about it. Why? You don't want to think about the problems. But you have to think about the problems. That way, when you're running a race and you come across the problem, you'll be ready and you'll be able to overcome it. You can't overcome problems in life by just not thinking about the problem. And then when the problem comes, you run away from it. That's n there's no way in life that you're going to run your race well that way. If you want to be certain and confident, you have to be prepared for what's ahead. Well, how do I do that? Do you read your Bible? Do you pray consistently to the Lord? Do you come to church so that you can hear good preaching, good teaching, have some brethren to encourage you? Without that, then you're not going to get God's instructions for the trials that come up ahead. Usually people in church who do well are those who hear about the trials, about their own problems from the preaching of the word of God so that when the problem happens to them, then they can fight it out. But the people who don't are those that keep looking at those preachers who smile at them and says everything's going to be fine and dandy. You know, it eases my mind more when I know certain problems are happening and I'm ready for it. It just eases my mind more. But then if you're uncertain and then when the problem happens, you panic. You get scared. So do you prepare for your problems? If you don't, then when those problems come, you're going to fall. You're going to get scared. You're going to run away. And you're going to cry and whine. What did I expect when I preached on this pulpit today? I had to expect the worst outcome, even though I was exhausted, that this is what's going to happen. Be prepared. So I was prepared. And guess what? I'm going to preach all the way today. I don't care how tired I am. I'm going to preach all the way to the end. Why? Because I prepared. I expected the problem. I'm not saying be stupid and then ruin your health. I thought about that too. I was prepared for that. But I trusted in the Lord's hand that this is my limitations. This is what I can do. I'm going to do it, Father. And when you do that, you're prepared. People aren't prepared. Why are there people missing in church today? Maybe they didn't prepare. Why are there people not able to come out soul winning? Visitation. Maybe because they didn't prepare. Why is it that uh, souls cannot get saved? Your church is not growing. You didn't prepare. Why is it that you quit out on the Lord? You didn't prepare. Why you fell back to sin and temptation again? You didn't prepare. A good marathon runner, he's also going to find the right path and not go down the wrong one, right? Obviously, if you go down the wrong path when you're running a marathon, you wasted your whole race and time. I completed 25 miles. And they said, you went down the 25 miles of nothing. Wrong way. 
And you're going to hate yourself after that. But that's a good Christian runner too. He's going to find the right path for him to take. He's not going to go down the wrong path. Why? His 25-mile race, 25-year race, his whole lifetime race, when he goes down that path and it's a wrong path, you wasted it. And you can say all you want, well, I finished my life. I lived whatever I wanted to do. Yeah, but you didn't complete your race. It doesn't change that fact. It doesn't change the fact you went to the wrong finish line. It doesn't change the fact you don't get your reward. It doesn't change the fact you wasted your whole race. And that's the problem with people today is that they spend their time in the wrong things in this life that they've chosen. And rather than the path that God has told them, you know, this is right. This is the decision you have to take. Go down this path. But you say, no, Lord, I want to go my own path. And when you do that, guess what? You are wasting your entire 26 mile, 26 year, nay, your whole life race. And some of you have already went through half of your life some of you already went through half of the race and you're still going down the wrong path. You don't want to waste your life that way. 1 Peter 4, 4 says, wherein they think it's strange that ye run not with them to this same excessive riot, speaking evil of you. See, there are people running with these wicked sinners. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, wherefore, seeing we also are, are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I mean, if there's something that you need to do when you're running your race is to look at Jesus Christ and his will, and it doesn't align with you. It's not your way. There's a sin that you're struggling with and a darkness that you're uh, trying to overcome. And you have to realize you can't look at those wicked things. If you keep looking at those wicked things, you're going to keep going down the wrong path. But when you set your eyes on Jesus Christ and then his word, prayer, and then Bible-believing church, if you keep your eyes on that one, you keep going down the right path. How many of you have I told you? who have been discouraged and don't feel like you're spiritually growing, I would tell you, no, just keep coming to church. You'll naturally grow. Why? You just need to keep looking at the path where God put you in, yes. not jump ahead 100, 100 miles and say, you know, well, what about this big thing, that big thing? No, no, no. You got to look at what the path you're in right now. Sure. And then if you keep tre treading that path, then you're going to go down the right path, not the wrong path. You know how you go down a wrong path is that you keep looking ahead at the right thing over there, but not at the path you're taking right now. You can still end up in the wrong path. And that's the reason why you have to look at your current situation and you have to realize, am I currently walking on the wrong path? Some of you won't get right with God. Some of you know what you need to fix now. And I'm not talking about your future. I'm not talking about some big thing you're going to do for the Lord. I'm talking about those little things. I'm talking about the things of now that you refuse to get on the altar and surrender to the Lord. And then how can you expect to go down the right path for the Lord if you just jump to the future without looking at right now at the path that you're walking in? Amen, brother. Get right with God now. You know the, what those little things are. You're just wasting your life already. Some of you are wasting your life, your years. If you look back before your salvation, how many years you already wasted? You don't want to waste more. You know, the good marathon runner, he's going to find joy in the race that he's uh, running. He's not going to think about, oh, this is so tiring. This is so tough. And think all these negative thoughts. Oh, my foot hurts. Um, I'm out of breath. Oh, I'm too tired. Well, you know, a good marathon runner, he's going to think about, no, 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 just keep it up. Just push it. You passed half of the race. You just got half more left. Look at that reward. Look at that prize at the end. I mean, look at the view around you. Isn't the view beautiful? You know, don't look at uh, how you're feeling. You know, that's what a good marathon runner will do. A good Christian marathon runner is not going to say, I can't go to church. My foot hurts. I can't read the Bible and pray. I'm too tired. Oh, you know, I can't serve the Lord and help out the brethren because I'm just out of breath and I've reached my wit's end. And no, you're not going to be a good marathon runner. 
you know, your problem is you're looking at too many negative things and you use those negative things as a convenient excuse to not run your race. A good marathon runner is going to look at the joyful things. Look at the world around you. Despite of sin, isn't it still beautiful of what the Lord has given to you in the race you've run? Look at the good things that God has done with this church, the mighty fruits that came out of it, good people in this church, and then things that the Lord has blessed you. When's the last time you looked at those things, thought on those things? And if you keep those things in mind, it pushes you to come to church. But I'll tell you what, if you keep thinking about a bad brother or a bad sister in Christ in church, you're not going to come to church. But if you keep your eyes on the good things about that brother and sister in Christ, you're going to motivate yourself to come to church. Yeah, that's right, brother. See, that's the thing in life is that if you're going to run your race successfully, you have to look at the good, not the bad. If I've done the bad all the time, then I wouldn't preach to you right now and I wouldn't come to church right now. You know, what draws me in here? You know, I think about the preaching of his word that can change people's lives. Having the privilege and honor to do that, no one's given it. God never gave it to anyone in this Bay Area for a Bible-believing preacher but me. Well, why would I not come and preach to you the word of God after that when he's given me this position and not to you and not to anyone else? You think I'm going to take this lightly? No, I'm going to run my race. I'm going to preach to you. I'm not going to use my tiredness. I'm not going to use, uh, you know, out of breath or any convenient excuse to not come to church. No, what draws me to church? Oh, the members, they, they came to hear a word from God, not from me anyway. So just go and preach. Just preach the word. They came to hear the word and not from Gene Kim. Thinking like that makes me run my race. You know, thinking about the fellowship with the brethren, the singing and all that. You know, keeps me running my race. Where are your thoughts upon? That's why you don't run your race. That's why the first sign of problem, you run away. Or you don't go through it. You know how you go through it? Look at the good. There's too much good that God has given. But you don't look at the good. Why? You're too busy finding the negative things in life, not the positive. Good, brother. Come on. You know, Paul says in Acts 20, 24, but none of these things move me Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. See, Paul completed his course. Why? He didn't think about the trials, the burden, the pain. He looked at the joyful things that the Lord has blessed him with. If there's something that makes you really happy and you want it so badly, you don't care what bad thing you have to go through for that. Did you get that? The idea is if there's something happy that you're really happy with and something that you, you really desire, you don't care what bad thing you have to go through to get that thing. If there's a lot of happiness and blessing and joy that God has given to you, then fight for that. Don't give it up and lose it. Go through anything bad for it. Just run your race to get it. My second point is follow the regulations. Follow the regulations. You know, if you're going to run your race successfully, you have to follow the regulations, the rules. And what I mean is not the world's way of regulations. You have to follow God's way of regulations. If the world says one thing, guess what? And God says another, you gotta have to follow God's way, not the world's way. Too many people nowadays bow the knee to bail and uh, follow the world's way of running the race. Good marathon runners, if this is the rules of the race, I'm going to do it. And they're not going to let some other person give some kind of false rule and they're going to abide by them. The good marathon runner is not going to cheat. He's not going to try to find shortcuts. He's not going to find ways to bend the rules, make things easier. He's going to say, no, these are the rules. This is how I complete my race. And if this is the path I have to take, I have to take that path. I'm not going to take some kind of shortcut or short route and complete my race that way. But there are too many Christian runners who take shortcuts. You think there are shortcuts. You think there's a shortcut for you to come to this church. You think there's a shortcut way for you to serve God. You think there's a shortcut way, a convenient, more easy way to do things for the Lord. And if you think that way, the Lord's not going to bless your life. Well, this, this path is too hard. 
Well, what do you think a marathon is? A marathon has challenges. It's not easy. Uh, do I have to teach the kids here? Do I have to come to church right here? Do I have to bring this measly stuff, food, water, kitchen utensils? Do I have to come early? Man, reading the Bible and praying, I mean, do I have to do that, this amount? Do I have to, yeah, follow the rules. It's not my way of doing things. It's not your rules, it's God's rules. And there's no shortcut, no convenient route. People who go by the shortcut, convenient routes, they might pretend and think they finished the race. I found a shortcut, so I finished the race. whoop de doo No, but the judge who sees everything knows that you did it. And that's your problem. Your problem is you have your own way of serving God. No, it does. Then you are wasting your time, time attending this church. You onliners are wasting your time watching us in this preaching. You might say, why is that? If God goes by your way of doing things like I have my way of running my race to serve the Lord, then what's the difference with you and Hillsong? What's the difference with you and a Catholic? What's the difference with you and a lost atheist? They have their own ways of running their own races in life. But God says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but at the ends thereof are the ways of what? Death. You're no different from all of them. You can call yourself Bible believer, dispensational, King James only. I go to Pastor Kim's church. I am a subscriber to him online, real Bible believers. You just have that outwardly, you Pharisee. You don't have it inwardly. You're not genuinely there. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.5, And if a man also strive for masteries, Yet is he not crowned. Why? Except he strive lawfully. Hebrews 12.1 says, When you're running, run, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So follow the rules. It's not popular. Who says it's popular? It's not easy. Who says it's easy? It's not my way of doing things. Who says it's your way of doing things? Didn't you hear before, or did you forget the preaching? It's always God's ways, not yours way. It's hard. It's not easy. It's narrow-minded, bigoted. It's not popular. Didn't you hear that before, or you just never believe that? That's God's way of doing things, and you have to run faithfully. you got to follow his rules. Don't compromise. Don't bend the knee. You know, a good marathon runner, he follows regulations by also not carrying extra luggage. You know, the marathon, they'll say that, you know, when you're running, don't carry this, don't carry that one. And some runners who are so successful, they realize that, that, you know, the lighter baggage that I carry, then the easier it is for me to complete my race and to finish it successfully. Some people do it, uh, no backpacks, to the point of no t-shirts, believe it or not. You might say, really? Yeah, because they make a very big deal on the slightest weight so that they can complete their race successfully. But that's the problem with Christians is that uh, you're carrying too much luggage and that's the reason why you're not running your race well. Well, I can't come to church early today. It's so hard. Why? Because of, because of what? Something you did yesterday? That's a luggage. Is it work? Is it school? Is it your own time and schedule, what you want to preoccupy with? What is your luggage? How can you expect to serve God, to please Him, to produce fruit, while at the same time you're spending all your time on something that's taking a toll of your health and your energy and your time? How can you expect to serve God, produce fruit that way? You can't. Now, look, I'm not telling everyone to get fired from work, you know. Then offerings can't go up, you know. I need you. (laughs) I'm just kidding. But the point is this, is that the point is, is that I understand there are things in life that are necessary, that you have to make a living, that you have to do to take care of your family or et cetera. But guess what? Those things will never, listen up, those things will never conflict with your race that God has put you in. Those things will never be the weight that prevents you from completing your race. No, instead, those weights strengthen you in your race. 
but are you carrying weights that you're wasting your energy on? That's what you don't want. Because you're not going to get new strength that way. You put the weights on yourself. I don't know what it is. Sometimes it can be spiritual things too. You might say, well, you know, uh, I want to spend more time in helping out the church and the ministry with this and that and that. Well, are those extra weights that you've done where you've now been backslidden in your Bible reading and prayer? People can be so preoccupied in the ministry that they don't have time for Bible reading and prayer. They don't have time to raise their children in the right way when that's the biblical way. Because they use the excuse of the ministry. It doesn't matter what physical, spiritual excuse you have. The point is, are you running God's race? Not your preferable, desired race of spirituality or carnal things or your own way of living. Are you running God's race? And if you are, what is your weight? What's holding you back? I'll tell you what, in the ministry, it's easy for me to think that way. It's easy to use the excuse of souls. It's easy to use the excuse of other people need me. It's easy to use these kind of excuses to put weights on my life. But the Lord has taught me that those weights, that God should be the one that should give it to me and I shouldn't be the one who puts the weight on myself. Because when I put the weight on myself, I'm wasting my energy. If God's the one that naturally puts the weight on me, he's doing it to give me more strength. I don't know what weight you're doing, but you need to change your habits. You need to change your schedule. You need to change your way of doing things. It's slowing down your race and you're breaking the rules. The Bible says in Galatians 5, 7, ye did run well. Who did hinder you that he should not obey the truth? God's saying, man, remember all those souls you led to salvation? Those times that you saw me moving in your life? Those moments we spent in prayer and Bible reading, those times that you've done great things for the church, who did hinder you? You were running so well, what stopped you? Well, I have this and that and that. You can't use events or splits or traumatic things as your excuse because you know what they are? They're your weight. And you cannot be free to run until you break free from that dark weight that's holding your mind. Hebrews 12, 1 says, let us lay aside every weight. You know, a good marathon runner, he's going to follow the rules and regulations by a very simple rule. You know what it is? If you're going to complete your marathon, finish the race. So if this is the starting line right here, on your marks, get set, go, and then you run, you're not going to run like this. You wasted your whole race. And the common sense is if you're running a race, you have to go this way. Problem with Christians today, as soon as they get saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're running the best race that they can ever live in their life. And God says, on your mark, get set, go. You know what they do when they go? They go like this. My sin. I'm not good enough for the Lord. My past haunts me. And I, I'll, I can't go to church because I'll never uh, do well for the Lord. That's what you're doing. And what you're doing, you're wasting your race. You're breaking the rules by running backwards. You know, Philippians 3, 12 through 14 says, Not as though I, I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Paul, when he's running his race to attain the prize, he says, I have to go forward, not backward. Paul's saying, I can't think about all those Christians that I persecuted in my past life i got to minister to these same Christians. He's preaching to the same Christians that he persecuted. Imagine him preaching at some revival meeting, and there's a mother there that he remembers that he tortured in his past, and he's preaching right at her, you need to get right with God. He's preaching at some father over there that he remembers, and then his wife, 
he just killed. And he has to preach at him that you will be worth it all. That through tragedy and loss, God is in it. How can you preach that? You know what haunts me when I, to run my race? It's, like, it's so easy to look at mistakes. When you become more responsible and accountable, especially souls, you tend to be more mindful of your mistakes. And then those things haunt me. Sometimes people who leave the church still haunts me to this day. Is it because of what I did wrong? I could have done better. I should have done more. I mean, there are too many things that haunt me in my life. But if I let the past dictate me, how can I preach to you today? I can't think about the people in this room who I may have made a mistake upon. I have to look at the prize and see what God wants me to do and just preach to you the word of God. You know what the problem with people is? They can't face the music. They make a mistake in the church. They're too embarrassed to come back. You know what you're looking at? You're looking at your past. You've got to face the music. Run your race. Get to church. Don't let the past haunt you. Listen, God already knows how wicked and crummy you are. He already knows. What more is there to reveal? Just run your race. Don't let the past pull you backwards. And just think about the prize, the prize, the prize. Yes, I made a mistake, but guess what? It's under the blood. Guess what? I repented. And guess what? I'm looking at what can I do to please God. That's all I'm going to focus on. If you go by the past, guess what? Some of you, if you keep running by your past and keep running backwards, you know what happened? The finish line is much further now. And that's what some of you feel, right? Some of you feel that finish line is just too far and it's too hard to reach. You know why? You went too much backwards. So it looks further and harder for you. You know what looks closer? I repent. It's under the blood. I go here. Well, what if I went backwards? I messed up. I backslid. Go forward. I messed up. I backslid. And just go forward. And then guess what? You feel like you're attaining something. My third point is to finish the race. Finish the race. A good marathon runner, he's going to finish the race. How do you finish? Well, it takes a lot of patience. A lot of patience. Going to have to keep running. And then there are some runners that when they reach that last lap, they just push it really hard, especially at that point. Some of them, when they're doing their first laps, they don't sprint it out. They just do warm-ups. They warm up. If they get tired and bogged down and they feel like they're going to drop, they don't push themselves harder. They do what they call a cool-down. That way they can retain their strength and energy to keep pushing. If you want to be a good Christian runner, you're going to finish your race with patience. The problem with Christians today is that they're seeing a room filled with people, they're thinking about a thriving, motivating, shouting worship service or a preacher who screams and yells dramatically at you. And when they have their idealized vision of that kind of a church, they have no patience when there are fights in the church, when there are bad days in church, when there are slow numbers in church, and when it's just you and the preacher. And when you have that kind of mentality, you can't finish your race. A patient person is going to expect Hey, slow down. It's not blowout yet. It's not summer camp yet. It's expected when I come to church today, there's going to be low numbers. It's expected in church today, singing might sound a little dead or half awful because some of the good singers are gone. Robert Garcia, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it seems like that uh, everything, the preacher is not in his best condition. Well, you know, what did you expect church to be? A blowout? A summer camp? You know, you're not running with patience. Well, you know how I get my blowout? It took me almost 10 years. Why well, I ran with patience. One people, two people. Grow to 30, drop to two. And then the Lord grew me again. To run with patience with, by myself in street preaching again. By myself in visitation again. Patience. Then the Lord gave me the blowout. 
That's what you need. You need to run patiently. Do you do that? You know how you're going to last a long time? You have to be patient. In order to be patient, well, think about this. Just like a marathon, a person, he's going to keep running, especially at the last lap. At the last lap, he's going to really keep on running. Do you think that way in your Christian walk, in your laps that you're running? No matter how hard that trial is, you're just going to keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. You have a resistance against the trials. What about the beginning when you start out for the Lord? Well, I said that I come to visitation, but it's harder than I thought, and it's not as exciting as I expected, and it's, what did you expect in your first lap? It's a warm-up. Do you do a warm-up? You know what? It's going to get better. My soul winning is going to get better after this. It's going to get easier for me after this. Warm up. Some of you, when you get so tired, do you rest? That's a cool down. It's going to be a long race. Guess what? Today is not my last Sunday sermon. I've got, pl- I've got so, if the Lord tarries, I've got years ahead to keep preaching to you the word of God. So what am I going to do? I'm going to be wise on how I rest. And that's why I've been telling some of you where I'm going to have to leave early and stuff like that. Why? Because I got I to gotta keep being your pastor for a couple more years. I got to keep offending you, making you mad at me a couple more years. I need to kick all these heretics and make them be annoyed by me a couple more years. You need, I need to just help some of you people who are broken the next years ahead. I need to help you guys out. So guess what? I'm going to take good care of myself. That way I can run a little further with you. Will you run with me? Are you going to run patiently? You know what patience is? Come to a church and you expect a lot of food, a lot of people, great preaching, great singing, etc., and you don't get the expectation you desire. And yet you come early anyway. Yet you set up anyway. Yet you help out anyway. Yet you say hello to somebody anyway. It doesn't matter about numbers or the lack of uh, motivation, etc. You just do it. You know, that is faithfulness. You know, I might be tired and worn out, but you know what this is an example of when I come to this pulpit? It's patience. It's faithfulness. That's what God honors. Some of you are, some of you weren't going to come to church next Sunday because you didn't have the idealized church service today. Some of you today, this was going to be the service that discouraged you and say, well, I don't think I'm going to come to Wednesday, Sunday because of, because of what? You didn't get your idealized church service today? Something bad happened to you today? You lack patience. You're not going to finish your race. So what if we have a crummy kids program going on and it didn't meet up to the children's expectations? So what that we have a crummy uh, church service where the preaching is not as desirable and really convicted you much to the point that I need conviction, but it's not convicting as much to you. You know, what's your problem, man? You know, you're not patient. You're not running with patience. You're going by things by your expectations. People who go by expectations are impatient people. Patient people are those that it, def- it ruins their expectations, yet they maintain. That's a patient person. You know, a good marathon runner, he's going to finish his race. He's not going to ruin it. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty common sense. You want to finish your race? Yeah, then don't ruin it. Well, simple. Not simple to a lot of Christians. A lot of foolish Christians, they just run their race and they ruin it. Why? Because they don't think about their testimony. That's the problem with people. People don't think about their testimony. Well, I'm right with the Lord. It don't matter if you think you're right with the Lord. You got to realize that God says abstain from all appearance of evil. God says that uh, you got to make sure at Romans chapter 14 that when you do good things, that it's done, that's approvable. Yes. It's got to be a good testimony. You know, the Apostle Paul, do you think you're better than him? You might say, no, I'm not. What are you talking about, preacher? Some of you think you're better than the Apostle Paul. That's why I'm trying to drive that. You know why? The Bible says Galatians 2.2, 2, and I, Paul, went up by revelation. 
and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation. Why? Lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. What was going on? Paul was preaching the Christian gospel. If you know your dispensationalism, that was something new that was given by Paul. Paul, was he doctrinally sound? Was he right? Yeah, he was right. But you know what? He knew he would waste his race if he was just unwise and just blurted everything out rather than privately going to the apostles and showing them what the Lord showed him. If Paul says, I don't care. I'm going to keep kicking and just preaching. Who cares? I offend. If he does that, then he would have lost his reputation with the apostles because it was new to the apostles. So Paul says, I don't want to waste my race. That's why he said, I don't want to waste all my race for nothing. So I'm going to talk to them privately. You know what? That was wisdom. You know what? That was being mindful of his testimony. Believe it or not, people make a big deal. Do you hear what I'm telling you? This is so important. A church, you can have great preaching, but it's going to amount to nothing if you're not good with people. It is, the ministry consists of people. What is a church? Assembly. You know what assembly means? People. You are no lick of good of a pastor if you can't be good with people. It is so important. You need to understand people. You need to be a good testimony to them. Yeah, you, what you might think, what you might say might be doctrinal, might be right, but is it good for that person? Now, look, I'm not telling you to be pansy-wansy and then just be overtly nice and fake it all out and then, you know, talk like a girl all the time, all right? What I'm trying to point out, though, is that there are times that I use sarcasm, that I rebuke, that I preach hard, but I am mindful of the people that I'm preaching at. And when I'm mindful of the people that I'm preaching at and mindful of my testimony, how I appear, guess what? It hones the way I preach. It doesn't change the way I preach, but it hones it in a way that becomes more convicting, more pointed to them and makes them try to open their eyes more to the scripture. What's the scriptural route? If I always acted nice, they're not going to open their eyes to the scriptural route. They're just going to always judge me by the tone of my voice. So the point is, it's not a matter of being mean or nice. That's not the point here. The matter is, are you thinking about people? When you do that, whether you're nice or mean, it doesn't change the fact you're thinking about people and you can minister to them. You need to think about people. When you come to church, you got to realize this, is that the person is your brother and sister in Christ. The way you act, the way you behave, the way you dress, they're going to look at you and they're going to say, you know, this person doesn't take the ministry seriously. If the person jokes a lot, if the person is always too dead serious, the person's going to say, you know, this person is not friendly. You know, that's how people are. People are like that. And you have to understand what people are, how they think, and you have to be appropriate as a Bible-believing Christian. Why do I dress like this? I dress like this because why? to show a good testimony to the people that what? This is a serious thing when I preach out of this pulpit. It's not casual, lackadaisical, and I'm going to come to you with pink jeans on. That's why people don't take church seriously. You know why? They see these kind of preachers. 60-year-old men for crying out loud wearing skinny jeans. What in the world, man? No wonder they don't take church seriously. But when they see you dress up like this, they take church seriously. When they see that... This is not what we do in church. This is serious. It's your testimony. Not only that, they see the love of Jesus Christ. Why? You say, hello, brother, sister. You don't talk to people that you want to do or your own time, your own convenience. They see you love them. They see this as a loving church. Why? Somebody they didn't know from Adam made them feel welcome. They know the people in this church cares. The pastor cares. Why? Let's do a prayer meeting. I'm praying for you. Hey, how are you doing? Haven't seen you last week. Everything all right? You care. They see this as a loving church. Why? Your testimony. You want to finish your race? Think about people. You know, even though I put a lot of things online, I am mindful of my testimony, how I appear to other Bible-believing preachers and churches. 
And you know what? That always keeps me back. Always keeps me back. Why? Prevents me from going a YouTube panorama where it becomes endless, like a lot of these people now who just only go by a YouTube channel. And because of that, they lose their reputation amongst Bible-believing preachers. What do I do with the, in spite of my YouTube channel? I watch for my reputation amongst Bible-believing preachers. That's why I have them come to this church. That's why I defend them. When, and then I recommend other people to go to their churches. It's my testimony. You may not care too much about that, but I do. And that's the reason why you're usually all alone, aren't you? 1 Corinthians 9, 24 says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8 says, I have fought, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, he's a judge of that race, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that also that love his appearing. Paul says, I finished my course. How did he finish his course? Paul says, everybody runs, but only one receives a prize. You know what that, you know what that is? That's meaning that, that this church, what Paul is saying to you is this. All of you are running a race. You're in a great Christian race. But not all of you are going to complete it. You know, I'm sad to say, I'm sad to t preach to you the Word of God. This is from the Word of God. This is from the Word of God that I'm preaching to this group. And I'm sad to say that from the Scripture it says that you're all running, but you're all not going to complete it. That's sad. You might say, why do you say that, preacher? Because that's the Scripture. Why did the Scripture say that? Because it knows your human nature. He knows what you're capable of. You don't want to be that person. The whole purpose of finishing the race, the whole purpose of doing all of this, you know, it's you get that prize at the end. You know, when you came to this church, you didn't came to this church for, oh, I came to receive love or a great preaching or some really neat teaching from Dr. Kim. No, what's your purpose? I'm running my race so that I can complete it for the Lord. I can get my prize for the Lord. I'm doing this for heaven. I'm not doing this for me or the worldly pleasure or something that meets my flesh or makes me comfortable. I came here for heaven. When you come to this church and it don't look like heaven to you, you got to sit your affection on things above in heaven. And you got to realize I'm coming for that one. I'm coming for that one. And you need to imagine where God is rewarding you and saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But you're not picturing that. When you drag yourself from work and then you're all worn out and you have a family fight and then everything just turned to hell and then your health is failing you and you just want to sleep or just do something. Some of you just have a hankering to sin again and then you just come to church and then everything feels like hell to you. You know what you need to do? You need to think about heaven. You're not thinking about when you, as soon as you walked inside this church that God said, well done. Good job. You're not thinking about that. When you open up your Bible and you bow on your knees to pray and the flesh is like, oh, I just want to sleep or, oh, you got other things to do in the schedule and then you don't think about God saying, good job. Well done. Your eyes are not set on heaven. There's just too many things on this earth. Is it really worth it all, you might say, for God to compliment me, to get that prize in heaven? Is it really worth it? Well, picture yourself as these two runners. That's what I would say to you. I'm going to give you just a simple illustration. That's it. Pretty simple. Picture yourself with this. And I want you to pick the runner that most likely fits you when I give you this illustration. All right? Pick the runner that likely fits you. Uh, there's a, two runners running a race, two of them. Pick which one that most likely fits you. There was one runner who uh, could not finish the race, didn't think the whole race was worth it. It's not worth it coming to church today, reading the Bible, praying, overcoming that sin, and then... 
uh, going through hardship, and not worth it. The first runner thought that way, and then he had a lot of trials happening, and then too many worldly pleasures and opportunities. There were sins that he committed that was hard to overcome. And he said, you know, the prize don't seem that valuable to me. That's what soon happened. And then pretty soon the prize got smaller and smaller, and he didn't finish the race. The second runner, on the other hand, in spite of the trials and worldly opportunities and anything that the devil could throw at him with sinful temptations, second runner said, no, I see the worth of that prize. And he pushed himself and he kept running. He finished his race. At heaven, the second runner took his reward. The second runner is like, this is something that I died for pretty much. I lived, spent my whole life for. I ran so hard for. Oh, I really wonder if this, this prize better be worth it, God. But you know what? As soon as he had that first taste of heaven, which he never tasted before, neither did you. So you have no idea when he tasted it. It was truly what God said. It's beyond all that you ask or think. And he said, wow, man, it's worth it. Then a million years passed by with his heaven, heavenly rewards, and he's like, man, I'm still enjoying this bliss, and it's never going to leave me. It's never going to leave me. The first runner, though, has nothing. It was like, that prize not worth it. But then when he sees that prize, he goes, whoa, I didn't expect it to be like that. I mean, you mentioned it was... I know you mentioned that in your word, but I didn't expect it to be like that, God. And God's like, see, you didn't believe me. That's your problem. Why didn't you believe me? Now you missed out your prize. And then imagine, imagine. You, the runner, thought that a hundred years of running your own race was worth it. And then when 100 years plus 100 years in heaven pass by, you go, what was I wasting my life on? I only had to run this race for about a hundred years. I wasted a million now. There is so much in that prize that would make up for a hundred years of your life. And the only time you're going to feel regret is not now. That's your problem. You think that, well, I don't have the joy. I don't have the desire. I don't have the regret of my sin and my ways. And that's the reason why I can't run my race. That's your problem. You think it has to be now. No, you know when that regret's going to happen? After you live one million years in heaven with nothing. That's your problem. That's when you're going to feel regret. That's when you're going to feel pain. And that's where you're going to hear all those things that you've heard from past sermons, but you just never believed it. How do you want to finish your race? Will you run to this altar and will you complete the rest of your journey after preaching is over today? Every head bow and every eye shut, the altar call is open. Your life is at stake here. Your life is at stake. You don't want to run and waste your whole life. Run your race. It takes a long time. It's not to your expectations, but that's what a marathon is. On your race with patience. There's a lot we covered here on this race. Perhaps one of these sins, one of these issues have, uh, have been troubling to you and it hindered you from racing. Let's refresh you. Did you prepare for your race? Did you prepare for what problems lie, that lie ahead? Or you hadn't? It's time that you prepare for those problems. You prepare your race more effectively. How can I run better for the Lord when these problems happen? Do you have certain sins that you're racing right now? You know, you're just wasting so many years of your life in sin. And some of you still are doing that. It's gonna, you're going to waste your whole life in sin. Uh, that's so sad. Imagine when we hit one million years in heaven. One million years in heaven without your sin. You think it's going to be worth it then, living in sin? 
when you run your race, uh, do you keep looking at the negative things? If you do that, you're going to lose energy more easily. You're going to pant more heavily. Your legs are going to get heavier. And it's harder to serve God. That's my point. It's harder to serve God when you're looking at negative things. A good runner is going to look at the good things. Look how beautiful the world is around me. Look at the blessings God has given to me. I am so thankful for what I have right now. You know, look at the power, the fruits that come out through this pain. Look at the blessing and the fruits that come out just by serving the Lord. Then you're going to run a little longer. Do you follow the rules when you run? Are you patient or do you take shortcuts? Do you say, I have my own way of running? If you do that, you're not going to complete your race. It's the same old, dreary old, dreary old, day in, day out. Just come to church, sing a hymn. Hey, I love you, brother, sister. Come on the altar, get right with God. Write notes on your Bible. Eat a meal together. Go home. Stay away from sin. Motivate yourself to read the Bible and pray. Get up earlier so that you can come to witnessing. You're fearful to tell that soul how to get saved, but you just go with the flow and keep trying. That's what it is. That's patience. Not shortcuts. It's patience. You lay aside those weights. You know, something's hindering you from coming to church more often, serving God more often, dedicating your life more to Jesus. And you know what that weight is, and you need to cast it aside. I don't know what it is. Your work, your desires, your own convenience schedule, your school, your friends, your family. You need to cast that aside. Some of you are letting your past dictate your future. If you've done that, that's the reason why you feel like you have a long way to serve God. The finish line looks harder to reach. You know why? You keep walking backwards, looking at your mistake, your past. Don't look at those things. Look at the future like, I'm, I'm worried about now what I can do for the Lord. I'm looking at that prize. I want to get that for the Lord. I just repent, get right with God, just get back to service again. Overall, are you going to finish your race? Are you going to finish it? You will never finish it. You will never finish it if you don't look at the prize. Think about heaven. Think about God's compliment to you. Is it truly worth it, you might ask? You're not going to get that answer until you go up there, and then you'll really know what I mean. But if I were you, I'd believe it now rather than later. Because later, there's no turning back the clock on regrets. Father God, I pray that today's preaching has uh, convicted, changed people's lives. We have an important race, Father. I'm going to run mine, no matter how long or how tiresome. I will run, Father. I will keep fighting. It may be a pain in the neck to not let the past dictate my future, to think about uh, the ministry and then souls and to not compromise. And then uh, the weariness and the trials that may happen in my life. I, I pray that you'll please help me to run, to watch my testimony as a Bible-believing pastor, especially online. May not be easy, but I will run, Father. This is my race. And I pray that the people will see that in me and that they will be encouraged to run their race. And may they follow Jesus Christ. May they follow Jesus Christ, not a pastor, but Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.